we are putting on a conference called Evolution Exposed. We pulled in experts on the subject of evolution for a total of 11 speakers and gave them just 15 minutes to give us their best. And on top of all that, a one hour Q&A panel session. You're going to love Evolution Exposed. Anyone can refute evolution. Due to the zoo, to me and you. Call that a fairy tale. Not allowed to ask questions. It made evolution look ridiculous. That was the foolishness of atheism. I yeah. knew I was going to get corrected. No, I wasn't even listening to your answer. <laughs> <laughs> this guy might be coming for you. Welcome to Apologia, and another installment of Evolution Exposed, Exposed. Our claim-by-claim -claim investigation of the Creation All-Star Mega Seminar. If you'd like to catch the series from the beginning, tap on the playlist above my head. Next in the speaker circle to take the light was E.Z. Zwayne, president of Living Waters Ministry. But rather than present evidence of his own, E.Z. threw to his more famous father-in-law doing one of his familiar man-on-the-street ambush interviews, hoping that somehow one more conversation between a 70-year-old street preacher and disinterested non-biologists would definitively disprove evolution. Well, now, Ray Comfort went out on the streets, friends, and he talked to people about this amazing thing called DNA. You an atheist? I am. While it is normally the pattern of this channel to pause after each Ray Comfort claim and to discuss what he said, with all due respect, he isn't really adding any new information to what he presented earlier. So instead, I thought today we could discuss how he's saying it, along with someone else who's made quite a reputation for himself interviewing strangers on the street. I'm kind of glad to have a chance to talk about the differences and maybe some of the similarities between the approaches, because I think when people see what we're doing in street epistemology, where we're uploading videos, interviewing people, maybe even on a college campus, it comes to a lot of people's minds that this is very close to a gotcha video that I've seen online. So it's nice to be able to finally clear the air, so to speak. So thanks for having me on. And for those unaware, what is street epistemology? Well, street epistemology is where you ask questions to help your conversation partner reveal the reasons and the methods that they use to arrive at their own conclusion. It's holding back on sharing your view unless they ask for it. The exercise is really intended to help that person take another look at the steps that they use to arrive at their conclusion. Walk me through it. Can you help me understand? That's what we tend to do in street epistemology. Well, I'm excited to look at this with someone who actually goes outside and does something in the ballpark of what Ray does. Very few people who are interested in the street epistemology approach literally go out to in initiate talks with people about their deeply held beliefs. But there are a few people who do it, and I'm one of them. I've been doing it for about seven or eight years now, and I love doing it. I had to curtail it, of course, because of the recent COVID issue. But I like going out and seeing if people are willing to explore their deeply held beliefs. And a lot of people are if you give them the opportunity and you build a little bit of trust, which is really Really important and try to understand how they arrived at their conclusions. What would you think the mentality of someone who thought a physical make itself? I think they'd be silly. Of course it can't make itself. Having a, a calm, informed, consenting conversation partner is very important when we're doing street epistemology. You may notice in the videos that I upload that I try to go to a great length to explain what I'm doing and answer any questions that they have, ask the person to surface their own claim. It could be anything. It doesn't even have to be about God or evolution. And we explore it. Good morning. How are you? Would you happen to have, would you happen to have like five minutes for like a quick interview before you do your hike? Uh, sure. Okay, thanks. Are you okay if I record it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. So, let me tell you what I do. Okay. Uh, I'm Anthony, by the way. I'm Kelsey. How do you spell it? K-E-L-S-E-Y. K-E-L-S-E-Y. E-Y. All right. I have these short five-minute chats with people. Okay. Typically before they do their hike or after, about a deeply held belief. And it could be anything. Okay. It typically goes like supernatural stuff, like God or karma, ghosts. So that's probably one of the biggest differences that I've seen. When I watch a lot of the videos from theists who are engaging with people in public, a lot of that stuff that happens before and after the conversation is not there. It's missing, which is one of the reasons why I, I try to go to lengths to show the whole interaction from the very second that I stop them or they ask me what I'm doing to the moment that they're walking away. And maybe I'll even give some thoughts at the end of it, too. And I think that that's really important so that people can see it. Now, it makes for a, a boring, longer video, perhaps, but I felt that that was an important trade-off. 
What would you think of the mentality of someone who believed the instruction book for life, DNA, made itself? There is a tendency I've noticed to ask leading questions in many of the exchanges that I've watched from theists. Note that Ray has set this interview montage to music. It's subtle, isn't it? But you have to pay attention to those things. I noticed that the music was sort of lighthearted and it's sort of campy, almost like poking fun or showing how ridiculous these views were. My advice for somebody watching one of those videos is, is ask yourself, what would this exchange look like if that music wasn't playing or maybe a different kind of music altogether? And what's happening with the edits? Why didn't I see the entire exchange? Where could I go to see the entire exchange? Because maybe that person had a really good answer. There is something a little disturbing about the editing and the music that I notice in these videos. I mean, here's my advice. If you're ever approached to do an interview in public, this, this applies to someone doing street epistemology or somebody standing on a step stool at the beach. Make sure one of your friends is also recording the interaction so that you have a backup. Because I am somewhat suspicious about the editing process that's often used in these exchanges. Uh, well, I think it'd be silly as well. We need investigation. That's atheism. Absolutely. It seemed like he was really quick to tie the silliness of something coming from nothing with atheism. Atheism simply means the lack of a belief in a god or the belief that there are no gods or variations of that. The idea of life coming from non-life or how did things start or did creatures evolve? These are things that are completely different. If you meet somebody who brings up evolution or intelligent design, let's say, as the reason why they think their God is real, I would ask them if their belief that God is real is dependent on evolution being false. And then you can very quickly assess, do I need to pursue this idea of evolution and intelligent design, or should we move on to other reasons? You can avoid a lot of frustration if you ask simple questions like that just to verify where are we going? What's really important here to you? What is a factor in your confidence that this is true? And then based on how they respond to that, you can pursue it. Many times people will say, I would still think God was real even if evolution can be shown to be true to me. You don't have to waste any time pursuing evolution or, or demonstrating that it's true or figuring out what their standards are if that's the case. And what would you think of the intelligence of someone who believed the instruction book for life made itself? Low, low intelligence level. Pay attention to where people are at and how they're standing or sitting. I've noticed many times that the person asking the questions or doing the interview is standing as opposed to the conversation partner who's sitting. In my view, you should be equal. You should either be sitting or both standing, that type of thing. It's a subtle thing, but there's some power dynamics that could happen in these exchanges that's really important to take into consideration. You can leverage these perceived imbalances to your advantage. And that's one thing that I try to not do. Like when I go out and interview people, I usually go and I stand. But if I'm sitting, I'd want my conversation partner to sit. I want them to see me as an equal physically and everything else. So that's one thing that I would watch for is, does this individual see their interviewee as an equal? And that's not the sense that I get when I watch these exchanges. They're, let me inform you. Let me correct you. Let me teach you this thing, you poor young person. <laughs> that type of thing. DNA happened by accident? Um, Probably not too smart. <laughs> now, if his conversation partner said that everything happened by accident, then that would be a good question to follow up with. But to lead with that, it's challenging for a person to say, no, 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 that's not exactly what I meant. It's a lot easier to say, yeah. <laughs> especially if there's a power dynamic involved. So that's why you'll notice in street epistemology videos, we ask a lot of open-ended questions. We don't want to lead people in a particular direction. And that's where it seems that these conversations go. Ray and other people, it seems, are bringing people to a conclusion that they want to bring them to. And you won't see that in SE videos. At least I hope not. You shouldn't. DNA couldn't make itself. It's impossible. Does that make sense? Yes. Many of the people that are on camera, they seem sort of guarded and maybe even caught off guard or they're not engaged. You know what I mean? Like they, there seems like there's a, they're vacant. There's not that connection with the questioner. And that's something that I think is really important. It's like, I want to see you as a human when I'm exploring these views with you. And I'd like you to see me as a human because it's possible that we may disagree on the claim that you think is true. And there's going to probably be a point where you want to ask me questions about my worldview. And it just doesn't work really well if you are flying in, asking a couple of questions, and then rushing out onto the next unsuspecting person. These messages that are being conveyed are often presented as like, this is the right ethical thing that God wants you to do. When we look at these exchanges, it seems like it's anything but. And what would you think of the person who believed that DNA, the instruction book for life, happened by accident? 
we're not just talking about human beings, we're talking about every form of life. Fleas, cats, dogs, elephants, cows. I have no way of knowing this for sure, but with Ray off camera, I sometimes get the feeling that he may be inserting different questions into these interviews in post-production. I've had the same impression from watching these interactions that there was a jump right there. What's going on? Why was there that camera cut? And I do camera cuts on my interactions as well, but <laughs> I wouldn't want to mis misrepresent my conversation partner. Why would I want to do that? I want to put these videos out there to teach people how to engage with others who hold these views. So Ray is doing a disservice in my view to his audience if he's doing that, because he could be setting his audience up for these really zinger kind of interactions. And if somebody attempts to replicate it, they're probably not gonna go very far. In fact, I ran into a guy early on when I first started doing this. Did you ever see this video? It's a street preacher basically in front of the Alamo back in 2014. <laughs> and he was doing basically the Ray Comfort. In fact, I even said, oh, Ray Comfort, you're, you're doing Ray Comfort here, right? Have you, have you ever told a lie? Of course. Well, God said according to his word that that would make you a liar. And hmm. I'd be a liar, so what would you be based on that? That's not going to help anybody. If you're using a script, if you seem insincere, your conversation partner is going to detect it. It's going to result in a guarded conversation partner. Everything has DNA, the instruction book for life, which makes the book in your hand just seem feeble compared to the infinite intelligence that must have put the instruction book for life together. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. What would you call this conversation style of Ray's? Messaging. Ray will ask a few questions to bring somebody to the point where they can then pass along their message. They're transmitting a message. That's what I often see in these videos. And this is something that you probably will never see. I think you might rarely see it in, in a street epistemology video where we've explored the person's reasoning and their methodologies. And then we say, now, by the way, here's the truth. Let me correct you in your worldview. We don't do that because we're genuinely interested in how you arrived at your conclusion, because it might be a conclusion that I want to adopt. And that seems to be really lacking in these exchanges that I've seen. Do you believe DNA happened by accident? Uh, I believe it could. Uh, explain it to me, how a program could make itself out of nothing on how to make a human eye, giraffe's eyes, elephant's eyes, cats, dogs, puppies, flowers, birds, trees. Every living thing has DNA that's so complex, it's mind-boggling. It must have been a genius beyond any human reasoning that put it together. Uh, of the 100%, I would say probably 40% of the people say that they want to explore their God belief. And when they start giving reasons for it, they may say evolution, like it can't possibly be true. It has to be designed. It's not a common reason, though. I would say of the people that I talk to who think God is real, intelligent design maybe is maybe 20% of the time they offer that. They just, they, they can't imagine evolution being true. So by default, this had to have all been designed. But then when we start exploring it, we start to realize by me asking questions, and I said, we, like they're discovering alongside of me, that they may be holding themselves to a different standard. They might set the standard very high to show that evolution is true. And yet the standard to accept intelligent design is not as rigorous. They'll believe it because they took it on faith or it says it in this book. But if in order for them to accept evolution being true, you've got to jump through these major hoops. But that doesn't mean the conversation's over. It just means you can start talking about why there's this discrepancy in standards. And to say it happened by chance is infinitely sillier than saying a physical book happened by chance. All I'm doing is reasoning with you. I'm not arguing. I don't want to win an argument. I'm just saying I want you to concede something that's absolute common sense. I'm not trying to win an argument. I just want you to concede something. Yeah. Gosh, dang it. Yeah. You see this theme coming up time and time again in his interactions. It seems like he's intent on winning, not understanding that the goal is to communicate a message to these people that he's interviewing, as opposed to revealing how they determine that what they think is true, which is what we tend to do when we go out doing street epistemology. Well, if the goal isn't to communicate a message, what would you say the goal of such conversations should be? Excellent question. One of the most important goals I think we should all try to set is clarity. How can I truly understand what this person thinks is true their main justifications for thinking that it's true and how do they conclude that it, those are good reasons to the point where I can repeat it back and you say, that's fantastic. I've never had it explained back to me like that, but that's, that's it, precisely my point. If we all strove to do that, that alone could be huge for discourse in this world, but it takes a certain level of uh, maturity and understanding, education, patience, taking your ego out of it. The barrier to do that is very high but it's achievable. We can do it. 
if we put our minds to it and we see lots of examples of people using that approach and making tremendous progress, which you don't see. I don't see what, what Ray's doing is progress. What is he really achieving there? I don't think he's probably convincing many people of the problematic arguments that these atheists have, which is probably what he's going for. I, of course, I'm biased because I'm an atheist and I, and I can empathize with the people who are on the receiving end of his interviews, especially as an inter interviewer myself. I'm, I'm like, oh, the, that poor person sitting there. Like, I, I really wonder how much was explained to them at the start. Good question. Are there any particular ethical considerations when starting up a conversation like this? Well, for one thing, I think you should give some consideration to the ethical implications of the conversations that you want to have with people. Literally take a few minutes alone and ask yourself, what am I hoping to achieve from engaging with people? What would be a success? What would be a failure? What would I want to understand before I consented to engaging in this conversation if it was me on the other end? These are the type of things that go through my mind. And this is a hotly contested issue in the street epistemology community. How do we make this ethical? Do we need to make it ethical? Should it be? My sense is that it should. I'm trying to advocate for an ethical exploration of people's beliefs where it's informed consent. They know exactly what they're getting into and you move at the pace that they're comfortable with. And don't just say, I'm just asking questions. You're doing more than asking questions in my view. So I think we have to go above and beyond explaining, even potentially at the risk of jeopardizing the conversation from starting in the first place. Sometimes people can be alarmed by what you reveal. And you say, I wanna ask you questions to challenge a deeply held belief to see if you can justify it to yourself. Would you be interested in doing that? And sometimes people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's what you wanna do? No thanks, I'm out. But that's good, that's okay. <laughs> I'd rather have that than somebody feel bad afterwards that they were duped or misled or, or misrepresented in some way. Any other potential downsides? There are some potential downsides to exploring a deeply held belief and then a person or even yourself recognizing that you can't justify it because your entry into the tribes that you trust and love and they, they respect you and have, you have all this history, that is potentially in jeopardy. You may have to leave that tribe if you realize I can't justify this belief to myself. And that could be a very painful process. We see organizations like Recovering from Religion sprouting up because of that very reason, that it's a difficult journey for a lot of people to have to rebuild. I think there comes a responsibility with these exchanges. When I step back and I look at all the things that we're trying to do in street epistemology, compared to these jokers who are out there trying to look for gotcha moments to message something about their theism or something like that or whatever, that's where I think we're different. Ah. <laughs> Friends, you got to love that. See how it is when you take the time to reason with people and open their eyes up to facts. One thing that I think is really different with the conversations that we tend to do in street epistemology compared to these zippy little gotcha videos that I notice from theists is that we want to slow down and take time to understand your belief tower. How did you build it? What are the reasons that's propping this up? And if you're only looking to message and correct people, you're not understanding how they themselves form their views. And that's the most important thing. They're the people that hold the views. They're the ones that have formed the reasons, hopefully, or at least are giving reasons that justify their views. And if you're just looking for zingers and to message to an audience, you're not going to end up really helping that person take another look at their views. What should Ray do differently? One of the biggest pieces of advice that I would give a theist who's engaging with people on the street or they're initiating talks this is advice really for anybody. I don't know if I would give advice specifically for one individual, but that is to, for the purpose of understanding your conversation partner's justifications and methods, try to take yourself out of it as much as you can and make it about them. Even if I wanted Ray to challenge me on my own views, I would ask that he try to make it about me because I'm the one that holds the view. But it's about him when I watch these videos. This is about his messaging and sharing the good news and converting people to Christ or whatever. I'm not entirely sure that some people are capable of doing that. And I've even noticed this on the atheist side, by the way. There are a few atheists that they seem incapable, let's put it that way, of putting themselves in another person's shoes or entertaining what they're saying for any degree of time. And that's a problem if you want to help a person take another look at their views, because that tension will bleed into your conversation and it will probably result in a guarded interlocutor. And it may even result in you asking less questions and messaging more, which is really what you don't want to do if you're interested in figuring out how they concluded that something is true. If you're interested in this gentle, more probing, more revealing, more useful style of communication, be sure to check out Anthony's YouTube channel, link in the description, subscribe today, and tell him that Apologia sent you. 
His videos had a huge impact on me as I was starting this channel, and I know you'll find them incredibly helpful too. Next time on Evolution Exposed Exposed, EZ will try to find a magic argument against evolution for people who acknowledge that they don't understand evolution. They feel like evolution is their Achilles heel. It's that crazy thing that's going to stump them and keep them from being able to share the gospel clearly with an unbeliever. <laughs> that's kind of weird. <laughs> See you over there. Later.